We live in the devil's world that's troubled with sin We look defeated but we know we will win Although we suffer and have sorrow and shame We know he's faithful and rejoice in his name Because we're just like him Remember what our Lord has said Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow Everywhere you go today, it's I, me, me, mine Look out for number one and don't waste my time But the Lord didn't teach us to live life this way He said to love and serve each other today And we'll be just like Him Remember what our Lord has said Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow He came from heaven above To serve with sacrificial love To give an example how to love our neighbor And find favor with God So take up your cross and follow Him Take up your cross and follow Him Take up your cross and follow We must remember the price that He paid And leave behind our selfish plans that we made Obey and love Him with all of your might And don't forget to always walk by His light Because we're just like Him Remember what our Lord has said Take up your cross and follow me 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 All right. All right. Uh, good evening. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter three, verse one? Daniel chapter three, verse one. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to do a new uh, start a new chapter, of course, this evening. As I mentioned, we're going to do that uh, by uh, this evening presenting an overview to the chapter. So we're going to go through the. Go through the chapter and uh, get an outline of the chapter and get a broad overview of the chapter of what we're going of, of coming attractions in the next couple of weeks as we study Daniel chapter three, which is uh, Daniel's not even involved in the chapter. We'll be talking about that this evening toward the end of class, and uh, among other subjects. And uh, uh, we'll get, what we see is that uh, the stars of the chapter, of course, are God, of course, because He delivers uh, Daniel's three friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And remember, they are. Their Jewish names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, uh, respectively. So they are, they are the, the main figures, the main characters along of this chapter, along with King Nebuchadnezzar and the dignitaries. They're involved in this as well. So we'll be continuing again with our study of Daniel chapter, uh, Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel here this evening, by noting an overview of Daniel chapter 3. So without further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to hear the teaching of the Word of God. That means uh, confessing our sins if necessary, applying 1 John 1, 9, and then we stay in fellowship, we remain in fellowship by obedience to the Spirit who speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. That's when you're obeying the command of Ephesians 5, 18, to be filled with the Spirit in Colossians 3, 16, to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in your soul. If there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting you, do it. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with that said, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, another day to study your word, to learn of your plan for our lives, to be conformed to the image of your Son. We thank you so much for giving us everything that we need to accomplish your will, uh, uh, identifying us with your Son, Jesus Christ, and his death and resurrection, and also uh, that you've uh, made us your children. Uh, You've regenerated us, giving us eternal life and dwelling us along with the Son and the Spirit. We thank you for the completed canon of Scripture and the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us learn and understand and apply accurately your word. We thank you for this study in the book of Daniel, and we pray that you would continue through the power of the Spirit to guide us in this study and to help us uh, help us to be transformed into the image of your Son through this study of this book. And we just pray, uh, thank you, Father, for the Thompsons opening up their home to us. We thank you for Titus and Tyler and their work with the uh, computers and the sound and the recordings. And we just pray, Father, that everything will go smoothly with the technology in the Thompson household. We thank you for those uh, who are here this evening, not only in the Thompson household, but those who might be viewing or listening to this class through Pal Talk or the website at a later date. And we just pray, Father, that everyone this evening would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment, help me to communicate accurately your word, and to do so with reverence and power and respect for your word, and that the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through the communicator, and also the audience, help the audience to understand what is being taught and to make a personal application of what's being taught uh, this evening. And we just pray, Father, that as a result of this Bible class, that the body of Christ would be built up and edified spiritually, and you and your Son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified. So, Father, we pray for these people and things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 is where you should all be. Again, as I said a few moments ago, we're going to have an overview of the chapter. Uh, Go through the chapter, present an overview, broad overview of what we're going to see in this chapter. And then, of course, beginning tomorrow evening, we'll look at verse 1 and start going verse by verse through this this particular chapter, in which we started a a, a note a little bit about what's going to happen in this chapter. We saw this at the end of Daniel chapter 2, verse 49. That verse is giving us, preparing us, for the events of chapter 3, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's three friends, are going to be thrust to the forefront in chapter 3 and having to confront the king, and they're going to uh, demonstrate their, their, uh, their determination to obey God, even if it costs them their lives. Uh, this is something like Daniel, these three are individuals that we, should, we can learn from. Uh, they loved God even to the point of physical death that it would cost them their lives. We should be the same. That's an example. This book, this chapter, has actually served as a great encouragement to God's people through different periods of the church's persecution and, uh, in, in the past. And it will continue to serve as a great uh, encouragement, not only now in the church age, but during the tribulation period when born-again Jews and Gentiles will look at this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they might even, who knows, if our material's still around during then, maybe they'll be studying these things from our uh, ministry as well as other ministries, and how they were uh, these three were able to bring glory, God, glory to God even though they were in the midst of tremendous pressure to conform to the standards of Satan's cosmic system. So these three, are going to help us, help us to uh, teach us how to, through their example, how to live a godly life in the midst of an ungodly world. And so that will be something we will learn uh, here in Daniel chapter 3. Now in verses 1 through 7 of this chapter, we have the record of Nebuchadnezzar building an image of gold. Look at Daniel chapter 3 verse 1. We, ha- uh, we have uh, Nebuchadnezzar, it says, the king made an image of gold the height of which was 60 cubits, that's 90 feet tall, and it's width uh, 6 cubits, that means 9 feet wide. And of course, that would mean it would be top-heavy, and we'll note what that all means. And he set it up on the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent word to, to, to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image, the statue, that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, 
and Psalter, excuse me, the bagpipe and all kinds of music, you had to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has sent, set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be immediately cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psalter, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language, which were represented by those dignitaries, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So what we see here is that when we'll develop this as we go into this chapter, we go verse by verse, we'll develop this in detail. What Nebuchadnezzar is doing is the result is the, is the motivation for him doing this, building this statue made of solid gold, which would be in the trillions of dollars, as we'll see. Uh, we see that he does this. The motivation for this is actually the dream. Daniel's interpretation of the dream that God gave him, he is, this is what he has done in response to that. He is doing what an unregenerate person would do. He is doing something that is appealing to his sin nature. He's deceived. He's taken this revelation that God gave him in Daniel chapter 2. And instead of being humble, and instead of bowing down before the God of Israel, Daniel's God, and the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, instead, he, worship, he builds a, a, a 90-foot tall statue, solid gold, of himself. This is not of anybody and any other God. It's of himself, and we'll see why. Because the main reason is there's an obvious connection between what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 and what he's doing here. Remember, it's gone to his head. Chapter 2, Daniel said, you are the head of gold. Daniel 2.38, you're the head of gold. You're the, most, you're, you're, the, the head of gold is the most valuable part of metal on the body of that statue. You're superior to all those kingdoms that will follow you. God is giving you authority over, over kings and nations and even creation itself, even the wild animals God has put in subjected to you, as we saw in Jeremiah <clears throat> and also Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. It's gone to his head. That's why he's, he's building this image of solid gold. He will not, he will not uh, listen to what the message was, and the message was this. You are under the authority of the God of Israel. Worship him. But he's refused to do that. Instead, what he's done is he's used that as a motivation, that revelation that God gave him. To, he's used this as motivation to make an image of gold of himself, which is foreshadowing and prefiguring what Antichrist is going to do with the abomination, setting up the abomination of desolation, which we're going to talk about in Daniel chapter 9 when we get there. We studied it in the day of the Lord. And the rebuilt Jewish temple during the midway point of Daniel's 70th week, he will declare, Antichrist will declare, declare himself as God. And so he will persecute uh, the Jewish people, in particular Daniel's three friends, Nebuchadnezzar. And this is foreshadowing and prefiguring the uh, Antichrist. Uh, persecuting the Jewish people who have trusted in Jesus Christ and the Gentiles. And so this is this, what we see here in chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar's actions are foreshadowing and prefiguring the actions of Antichrist during Daniel's 70th week, which is future to the rapture of the church. So we see here that the king is a megalomaniac here. He's, he's insane what he's doing here. He's insane at this point. Because he's rejected revelation from God. The revelation from God was not given to him so he could be puffed up and arrogant. It was given to him to humble himself. And there's an application that we'll see in the future. God doesn't give us the Bible, the Word of God, when he gives us messages. He's not giving it, give us these messages from, through the Spirit and the Word of God so that we can get puffed up and arrogant and think we're better than other people, but so we might be humbled before him and humble before men and, and to uh, and do his will rather than uh, try to promote ourselves or make, us, make ourselves bigger than we really are. Nebuchadnezzar misapplied the message that God gave him through Daniel. And that's a danger that we can come involved in because we have a sin nature and we too can be still and we can still be deceived by the devil. So we need to be humble when we hear revelation from God. Nebuchadnezzar has not done that. He's still an unsaved person and his actions here 
And uh, we'll see later on in chapter 4 are going to lead to his being deposed by God for seven years. And God's going to give him a mind of an animal. And he's going to act and think like an animal for seven years until he finally humbles himself, which was that was the point and the purpose of the message that God gave through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. To humble yourself, Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, I gave you authority, but that means you should be responding and serving me and worshiping me rather than your Babylonian gods, which are nothing but demons, as the Apostle Paul has taught us, and Deuteron Moses in Deuteronomy has as well. <clears throat> so there, was a verse, there we have in the first seven verses, the stage has been set, because this is what Nebuchadnezzar has done is caused the problem now for Daniel's three friends. Daniel's nowhere in the picture. We'll explain why. But here, Daniel's three friends are in big trouble because they're Jewish people and they've been told by God, and we study this in Exodus, you shall have no gods before me. You shall not worship gods, the other gods, the false gods of the Canaanites and the other peoples, heathen peoples. So this has created a problem for them. Just like uh, when, they moved, when they had to t eat the king's food and drink his wine in chapter 1. They, that was a problem for them because they're under the dietary regulations of the law and therefore now they, have a, they had a problem to deal with and they, God solved it for them. But we see here now God's going to have to solve this problem for them. And so we have here, a stage has been set, a confrontation will take place between Daniel's three friends and Nebuchadnezzar all because, all because Daniel's three friends seek and are determined Good word, determined to obey God, and they will obey God, even if it means disobeying the king's edict, which is going to give us another good study in this chapter, that of justified civil disobedience, which we studied in Exodus, where the uh, Hebrew midwives refused to kill, uh, obey Pharaoh's order to kill the infant Jewish baby boys. And we saw that was justified civil disobedience. So God has told us as Christians and God's people, you're to obey the civil authorities. You're to obey God. Well, what happens if there's a, 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 what if there's a conflict between the two? What if the government tells us to do something that is against the word of God? You do what God says. That comes first. That takes precedence always. And that's what we're going to study in this chapter. Great chapter for justified civil disobedience. But notice, they have a problem here. They can't worship idols, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because God and his word and the Ten Commandments told him this. Hold your place. Look at Exodus chapter 20. Let's see this. Exodus chapter 20. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. A chapter we've studied already in detail. I know those pages are so thin. I'm afraid of ripping mine when I'm using it. Yeah. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, the words to follow, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, if they, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego bow down and obey the king's order, they've done that. And it, let me tell you something. It's, again, another situation where there's t they're being tempted by Nebuchadnezzar and Satan, uh, who's behind this, to compromise. And there's no compromise. God's obedience is first and foremost. There's no compromising our obedience to God. And then he says, you shall not, uh, not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or above or on the earth or beneath the, or beneath the earth or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to those who love, my, love me and keep my commandments. Look at verse 23. You shall not make other gods beside me, gods of silver, gods of gold, which Nebuchadnezzar has done. You shall not make for yourselves these things, he's saying. So there we have Daniel's three friends got a problem because God told them, I don't want you do worshiping any gods. So they can't do this. They can't, do the, they can't obey the king's order in Daniel chapter 3. Now go back to Daniel chapter 3, please. Daniel chapter 3. Look at verse 8. Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. In verses 8 through 12 now, 
we have the record of uh, certain Babylonian officials, uh, they're most likely officials that were in the province of Babylon, okay, in the province of the city, city of Babylon, because remember, what happened in Daniel chapter 2, verse 49? What, what does it say in Daniel 2.49? Look at that verse real quick. Look at Daniel 2.49. What did it say? It said, And Daniel made request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. So they got promoted to be administrating over this, this, the province of the city of Babylon. Well, in Daniel chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, certain Babylonian officials who more than likely were unseated by these three and their promotion, they accuse, and they're right, they accuse Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego of insubordination to the king, which is true. But they did it because they want to get rid of these guys because these guys have unseated them from their place of power and therefore they want to take out Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans, that's a, remember, that's another... Uh, Another name for the Babylonians in this chapter. It's talking about certain Babylonians. It's a synonym for Babylonians. Came forward and brought charges against the Jews. And the rest of the next several verses tell us specifically which Jews they were accusing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel's three friends. And they responded, verse 9, and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, that's which is accustomed to say that. It, they weren't simply buttering them up. Uh, this was just politeness before the king. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psalter, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a furnace, a blazing fire. So they repeat the king's command and ultimatum if they don't obey the command. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed. This is amazing what they're doing here. They're accusing Nebuchadnezzar of making a foolish decision here, of promoting these three. They're certain they get away with it. And, I'll, we'll, in the, and we'll note this when we get in this verse, why they got away with it. There are certain Jews, remember tonight's just an overview. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you, meaning they disobeyed his command. They do not serve your God. Uh, it's not in the singular. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's speaking of the God that Nebuchadnezzar set up in context, the big image he set up of gold. So it's actually in the singular. In fact, I think the ESV brings this out. They don't translate it as in the plural because the reason why that is is because the next statement is exegetical explaining what it means that they, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel's three friends didn't serve his God. Namely, we could say, they don't worship the gold image which you have set up. So this is, here they've been exposed, they disobeyed, and listen to me, I'm sure they were ready to, for the consequences. See, this is what something we, that you got to understand here. It, obeying God, obeying God can sometimes cause con uh, con confrontations. It could cause confrontations with civil authorities. It could cause confrontations with another believer who's disobedient. Obedience to God could cause confrontation with an unbeliever. And so we see it could cause confrontation with your bosses at work or anybody who's not obeying God's word. And so when you obey it, it could be, there could be consequences. And consequences which could threaten your life, your job, uh, uh, your uh, security, your home, you don't know. There's, there's always, uh, Satan's always trying to uh, persecute God's people. So we see here that this is co brought consequences. Their obedience to God is brought about a consequence that they're more than willing to face because they seek to please God, which we left off with last evening. That's number one priority. They weren't going to compromise, and even if it cost them their position, and even if it cost them even if it cost them their lives, they were going to still obey God. Now, as we saw last evening, a lot of Christians compromise. Uh, I'll, I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example one time that happened to me. Years ago, I worked for this guy, and uh, I was, uh, we, I went one, one time, uh, I, was I was going to Bible class. I was going to Bob's place, the Grace Bible, and I was, you know, he taught six times a week. You know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and, and Sunday, and at one time it was su Sunday morning and Sunday night. And uh, for a long time. And I remember I was going, you know, and, and my bosses would be going, hey, where are you going? I said, 
you know, because they'd like to play ping pong after, and I'd always kick their butt. But anyways, that's not the point. But uh, good game, ping pong. And so I, uh, I would say, I'm going to Bible class. Well, at one point, my boss was, uh, I don't know why it was a big deal, but uh, he goes, hey, uh, he, he said, you know, I need, can you go down to Florida, and it'll be like during this week. And I said, can't do it. He says, he says Bill, I'll give, you a, I'll give you 500 bucks. So we'll go down. It's like, oh. And I said, no, I can't. I get Bible class. And I was doing the prep school and everything. I said, I have responsibilities to God. You know, go to Bible class, and uh, I, I want to go there. And, you know, the $500 is meaningless to me. I mean, so I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice. Uh, I remember one time, I remember, uh, you know, I remember one time when I first became a Christian, um, you know, the Catholics, my grandmother died. I was really young. I was in my 20s. And my grandmother died, and they were Catholics, of course. And then they had this, and after a year, they have a mass for the dead. And I refused to go. And I refused to go because I said, I said to my mother, it's like, everybody knew my, you know, my, my grandmother loved me, and everybody knew I loved my grandmother. There was no question about that. And I said, but I disagree with that because the Bible says not to pray for the dead. I said, she, I know, I talked to her, I know she's in heaven right now, so what are we praying for? You're disobe- it's, it's not in the word of God. But I took a lot of grief for that. I took a lot of grief in my family, but I had to make a decision. Am I going to listen? Am I going to get pressured into doing something that I think that I know is wrong? You know, you're not to pray for the dead. And so I had to make a choice. And I said, no, I'm not going to go. And, you know, I had to take the consequences for it. And uh, they got all, they understand, over the years, they've, they've understand, they've seen me teach. So that's smooth. A lot of that's smoothed over. But still, you know, I've had confrontations with my family. I'm sure you guys have had, you know, if, well, you know I don't know that not everybody has, a lot of people have families like Jim Ricard and, Titus, who have parents that are positive of the word of God, but uh, some of us, you know, have family members that are not. So you, sometimes that causes a confrontation. So you have to make up your mind, you know, and some Christians, they can't take the pressure because they want people to like them. And if you're a pastor, for instance, I mean, if you're, if you're a people pleaser, you're, you're, you're a waste as a pastor. I mean, you're just wasting your, you're, 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 dis- you're disgracing yourself in the Lord and uh, by acting that way. Because of all people, a pastor has to be somebody who's willing to take the, uh, the conse- persecution for being obedient to God. And so uh, we see here that, uh, hey, I rem- I, I'm, I've, been, uh, I've been criticized. Uh, if, you know, I had to teach, you know, the Bible says, you know, wives, obey your husband. And, you know, I'd always, you know me, I, I always teach in the same breath, and husbands obey your wives, uh, obey, obey your wives, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Well, I got criticized for, for, for uh, my teaching was criticized as being de- uh, de- demeaning to women. What, because I'm teaching the word of God? You know what I did? I went home and I rejoiced because Jesus said, rejoice when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, meaning doing the right thing by God. So that was a great thing. I loved hearing that. That was a great encouragement. Being, Good, I'm getting, I'm getting criticized for doing what God told me to do. But some pastors won't dare say that about to, to, to women in their congregation because they'll pack it up and leave because you have a lot of women who are Christians who are ungodly in their thinking and rebellious to their husbands and God. And I can't, I, you know what? You can't, you can't listen to that. If they don't like you, they want to criticize you, then so be it. Give it to God. Don't take out your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God. You do what God says. Obey him. And that's what the example for that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's three friends are giving us. They, they're ready for the consequences. No matter what happens, bring it on. Even if it means you're going to kill me. And they knew that this, by doing this, they knew what this meant. They're probably going to die. Now, verses 13 through 18, we have these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, demonstrating great faith in the Lord in the face of being executed by the king. Look at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego then these, these men were brought before the king. That means into this presence. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God? Note the translation. Namely, you do not worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltera, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will be immediately cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And this is where he challenges their God. And he knows who their God is. He's confronted God. And Daniel telling him the content of his dream in chapter 2 and its explanation. 
So he's, he's conf- he, look, what he says to, look what he says in verse, uh, in, uh, verse, at the end of verse 15. And what, this is amazing that he says this. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands, meaning out of my power? So there we have, he's challenging the God of Israel. Daniel's God and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God. He's saying he can't do it. He can reveal mysteries, but I doubt he can deliver you out of my hands. He's challenging their God. So, the response, uh, so then we go on to say, uh, it, we have uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response to the king. It says in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. And actually, their answer here in verse 16 is actually a response to the rhetorical question. When, they, when he says, what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands, their response in verse 16 is related to that question. Now, in relation to his repeating the command to them in verses 14, 15, and 16, and the question they ha- he had, do you, is it true that you're not going to worship my God? And then he says, you to obey the command. If you don't, uh, the, the ultimatum is, is that you're going to die if you don't worship, uh, you don't obey my command. Well, in verses 17 and 18, they answer the question of his in verse 14 and the command and the ultimatum in verses 15, in verse 15. But in verse 16, he's re- they're responding to the king's rhetorical question. What they're actually saying there in verse 16 is, we'll leave that up to God. They're actually, what we see is that in the grammar, in the, in the Aramaic, it's quite interesting. It's a big contrast. They're saying, for as for us, as for us, we can't, we can't comment on the matter. That's, be- that's between you and God. So that's what they're saying. They're, they're saying, uh, they're, they're leaving that to God to answer his an- rhetorical question. Then he says in verse 17, now, he gives, now they give their, his, his answer to that. Now they give their answer to the king. No, we're not going to worship your, your gold image. It's true. We do not want to obey your command because we've been told by our God not to do that. Verse 17, if it be so, our God whom we serve, this is great faith here, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, even if you, we're gonna, you're going to execute us, that we're not going to serve your God, or wor- namely, worship the gold image that you have set up. So they're saying, you can kill us. I'm ready to, we're ready to die. That's faith. They totally trust in God. I mean, what can they do? Remember Jesus said, don't fear, when he talked about persecution with his disciples and the apostles, he says, don't fear those who can kill the body. But fear God who can cast both body and soul into Gehenna, into, into hell. So he's saying, don't worry about those people who threaten to murder you or kill you. He says, that's all they can do. Because when you die as a Christian, you're absent from the body face to face with the Lord. You're going to get a resurrection body. So whatever they do to you is negated by God. They really, they, what they're trying to do is not going to f- accomplish what they think it's going to do. You're going to continue on. You have no, you have no need to fear anything. And that's what Jesus taught his disciples, and these guys know about it. Daniel's three friends are ready to die for their, for their faith in God. They're going to obey him, even if it costs them their lives. Now look at, ver- uh, look at verse 19, because in verses 19 and 30 now, we have God delivering Daniel's friends from the fiery furnace. Uh, look at verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath because of their response. How dare you defy me? This is probably the first time this guy has ever been defied by anybody. Because what he did in verses 13 through 18 was intimidate them. That's obvious. He's trying to intimidate them and say, look, you really want to do this? Because you know the, alt- the alternative if you don't. You're dead. Now, he's never met anybody outside of somebody, a warrior dying for his country who would dare do this. Why would they give up this position in Babylon, high position? Why would they, why would they give it all away to obey their God? Because they love their God. They're loyal to their God. That's why they're going to do it. Look at verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. I think he's a little mad. And he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, 
and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been extremely hot, the flame of the fire killed, slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here's an example of Nebuchadnezzar's anger, his rage, his blind rage, costing him something dearly. Three val valiant soldiers, they lost their lives because Nebuchadnezzar was so intent on not only killing these guys, but incinerating them. Look at verse 23. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste, and he said to his officials, <laughs> I wish I was there for this, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. That's, a pre, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. That's a Christophany or theophany. A pre, that's a, a, uh, an appearance of Jesus Christ be, uh, and, uh, pr before he became a man permanently in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Ver it's a visible appearance of him. Look at verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire, and he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satra And I wonder what all those people in Nebuchadnezzar's faces look like. Yeah, look at this. This is what it looked like. It's like, it's, it, looks like, it looks like Tyler when I go like this. Tyler goes. A little, a, little, a little bit of fear and wonder. Man, I wish I had muscles like Pastor Bill. That, they were astounded. <laughs> What's so funny? Now look at verse 27. And the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around. I bet they did. And saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Now, there are some, amazingly, people, not amazing, well, it's, 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 it's a mark of an unregenerate mind, but there's some people who have studied this book, and it's usually the liberal scholars, and they say, they, even leave that, they don't even look at this chapter, because they don't believe it. They don't believe that God can do a miracle like this. I mean, if he can raise from people from the dead, if he can be raised from the dead, can he do this? Why is it so? They don't believe in the supernatural because they don't believe that God is imminent if they believe there's a God, they, meaning he doesn't intervene in the fears of men. So here we have, just, and let me tell you something. Some people say, well, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen a miracle. You really haven't? Have you not? You haven't seen a miracle, none of you? I've seen a miracle. I'm actually witnessing a miracle right now as I speak. Titus, what was that thing you were saying? One time you said, uh, and I want to explain the miracle, why we're seeing a miracle right now. You said that there's, in, uh, we're talking about how uh, somebody in my family had said, oh, what about life on, you know, the, what are the odds of life on other planets or something like that? And you go, well, the, uh, the, it's the, the odds of life being on Earth are astronomical. They have, what, it has to be, how much? Too many things, I'm paraphrasing you, too many things have to go perfectly for there to be life existing on earth for us to breathe. It's a miracle. The fact that we're living and breathing and speaking on a, a clump of dirt in the middle of <laughs> huge universes and galaxies and there's only life is on here. What are the odds? What are the odds of having oxygen? I mean, we have, a, we have oxygen, we have an atmosphere, we have water, I mean... The odds are astronomical for all these things to work together. It's a miracle. We're living in a miracle. It's supernatural. You're living a miracle right now. Every day you breathe, every moment you breathe. I mean, just exist. I remember one of the time when I got saved, one of the things that this guy led me to the Lord said, he said, look at you. Look at you. You're, you're you. I, you're in your head right now, and I'm in my head. How, that, that's evolution? That, that, I mean, he said, and we don't, and you're, the invisible you is in your soul. 
that's a miracle in itself that you have make a dis- you're able to uh, rationally uh, make rational moral decisions of right and wrong. That's a miracle that you have that in your head that murder is wrong, that adultery is wrong, that stealing is wrong. And, and, and every every culture has that because it's and that's a, that inherent law that Paul talked about in Romans two fourteen and fifteen that's written in the souls of every human being. And so, which is, so therefore, that's a miracle. We live in a miracle. So miracles happen all the time. Sometimes God does things that, you know, we don't normally see. Usually when you throw somebody in a furnace, they're burned up. But here, he decided, because it was going to fulfill his purpose, that he's going to do something here so he could give us, the, his people, encouragement for the future. That he is a God of deliverance. And he has this ability to do this. In fact, all of us are going to face a miracle, if you want to call it that. When we die, the minute you die, you're going to go like this and go, ah! and the minute we take our last breath, you're going to be absent from the body, face to face with the Lord. There's a miracle. You're still alive. Jesus said, even if you die, you live. He who believes in me, even if he dies, he lives. So you're going to be, you're all, every one of us is going to see that miracle. We're all going to experience a per- personal miracle there at that time. So here we have these guys these guys have been delivered by God. He's a God of deliverance. Look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, blessed be the God, he's meaning he's worthy to be praised, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Jesus Christ, the God of Israel, shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there's no other God who is able to deliver deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Wow. So here we have the king he still, hasn't, he still hasn't bent his will, bowed his will to God. He's still not made the plunge. He's not calling Daniel's God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, the God of Israel, his God. He's, pra- he's praising him. He's saying, that's a great God you got here. That's pretty good. He, they, he, they deliver him out of that. I've never seen that one. I've never seen that one, guys. He's pretty good God. This is pretty good stuff there. But he's still not getting it. God's working on him, though. God's working on. This is another step in the conversion of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Daniel chapter 3, as we've read, records Nebuchadnezzar constructing an image of himself, which is the direct result of Daniel's interpretation in Daniel chapter 2, verse 38, which records Daniel telling the king that he was the head of gold of the statue. Remember that? That's why he's built this this statue. And this is a good point that Titus uh, uh, brought in. The head of gold, the head of gold, in chapter 2, right? Well, chapter 3, the whole statue was uh, gold. Now, as Titus brought out, you know, maybe Nebuchadnezzar is saying, what was he saying? He's rebelling against God, saying, I, I, instead of uh, just saying, I'm a part of a, a, of a bunch of uh, different Gentile powers, I'm rebelling against God. I'm going to make the whole, st- I'm going to make a, recreate that image I saw and make it all of gold and defiance of God. Basically, is that right? That's pretty good. Because that's what he's doing. That, I, I'm, I'm sure of that. He's, he's, because his actions that we see later on in chapter 4 confirm that. And his actions, his response here, he's still rebelling against God. So, there are some commentators who suggest like Archer, Gleason Archer, who's a great commentator, great scholar, that the statue was not of himself, but one of the Babylonian gods like Nebu, Nebu that we mentioned last evening. However, there's an obvious connection between the head of gold in the statue and Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 and the gold statue constructed here by the king in chapter 3. The events of chapter 2 and 3 are right on top of each other. However, there's some scholars say that that's not the case. That the events recorded in chapter 3 follow the events recorded in chapter 2 is indicated by the fact that Daniel's three friends are functioning in their new positions of authority. Daniel 3.12, so, to which they were appointed by Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, verse 49, per Daniel's request. Furthermore, chapter 4 records the Lord judging Nebuchadnezzar and deposing him for seven years and giving him a mind of an animal resulting in the king 
acting like an animal for those years. And this was to bring about, uh, bring the king to the place where he acknowledges the Lord's sovereignty over him and that he's subordinated to the Lord. Now, the construction of this image was due to his megalomania, which the Lord deals with in chapter 4, which records the Lord's response to the arrogance of Nebuchadnezzar recorded in chapter 3. So Nebuchadnezzar's actions in constructing an image of himself to be worshipped, that was not unusual in the ancient world. Assyrian kings did this sort of thing. The Roman emperors did this thing. They deified themselves. So what everything that Nebuchadnezzar is doing here, it's not unusual. Uh, building a, uh, so I, uh, as I said, in response to guys like Archer, who I greatly respect and are great commentators, they say that this is not a statue of himself. Well, it is. And there's a number of reasons, as I just mentioned, factors. One, it wasn't unusual for kings of that day and later on to deify themselves. The Assyrian kings did who came before Nebuchadnezzar did that. The Roman emperors after him deified themselves. So it's not unusual for Nebuchadnezzar to do this. Also, there's an obvious connection between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Because Nebuchadnezzar was said to be the head of gold in chapter 2, verse 38. And now what is he doing? He's building a massive statue, but he's making it of solid gold. Obviously, the statue is to try to recreate what he saw in his vision. And the gold, making it solid gold rather than just the head of gold, was to deify himself. Because in the interpretation, Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're so powerful. God has given you all this power over the nations and kings. Remember that in verses 37, 38 of chapter uh, 2? He said, and you're the head of gold. You're the, you're the most, your you're government, you're, the character of authority and rulership in your government, as represented by the head of gold, makes you superior to these other nations that will follow you, other kingdoms. Went right to his head. Went right to his head. And so he is, so we see there's an obvious connection between this statue in chapter 3 that he erected and the gold statue, the head of gold in the statue in his dream. They're connected. And some say that the events of chapter 2 and chapter 3 are decades and decades apart. That's not the case, as I said. Because the events in chapter 2 and chapter 3 are very close to each other because we see Daniel's three friends operating in their new positions, which were as the result of Nebuchadnezzar promoting them in chapter 2. Chapter 3, we see them operating in their new positions. So therefore, the whole thing we see here is Nebuchadnezzar is making a gold statue of himself in rebellion against God. He's, against, he's rebelling against God. How do we know that? Because the whole point of giving, him, Daniel, giving Daniel, giving him the content of the dream and the interpretation was to get Nebuchadnezzar to worship God, the God of Israel, rather than his Babylonian gods. But what does he do? In response to that, he makes a, a statue of himself. He's in rebellion, and he makes it all of gold. Here's one God. Your God, he's not that powerful. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm rebelling against that. He's defying that. And me and the unregenerate man does that. He rebels against God. Now, why would he do this? Why would he do this outside of arrogance and megalomania? Well, one of the great Bible teachers of the last century, I mentioned one last evening, John Walvoord, another man who I learned a lot and really who inspired me to go back to the original languages and study uh, like, uh, and, and really d go into it, into the Word of God, was a man named J. Vernon McGee. His radio broadcast is still heard around the country. In fact, you can download from his website his, his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his classes. He, did, he went through the whole Bible in five years. He had cancer at the time. He was a great Bible teacher. He was at uh, uh, the Church of the Open Door in California, very prestigious church, and he was, uh, <clears throat> he was one of those individuals. He, all of his, you can get his downloaded stuff in MP3 form like ours, the audio of all, every book he's, uh, of the Bible, that, and he's excellent. He was an excellent Bible teacher. Um, so he, he, J. Vernon McGee, he uh, addresses this issue as to why Nebuchadnezzar would do such a thing after he just received revelation from God that God would destroy all Gentile power Gentile power, and establish his kingdom on the earth. Well, McGee writes this, and I'm quoting from him. What did Nebuchadnezzar really have in mind in making this image? We can observe here three things. One, the making of this image shows the rebellion of Nebuchadnezzar against the God of heaven, who had given him world dominion. Instead of gratitude, this is a definite act 
or rebellion. A, def a definite act of rebellion, he says. Number two, this also shows his vaunted pride in making an image which evidently was self-deification. The Roman emperors also attempted this later on. I mentioned all this before. Verse three, obviously, Nebuchadnezzar, and this is, this is gonna, we're going to talk about this a little bit more to, uh, tonight. We're going to talk about this tonight and in detail in the future, this next point. Number three, he says, Nebuchadnezzar was seeking a unifying principle to weld together the tribes and tongues and peoples of his kingdom into one great totalitarian, 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 what is it? Totalitarian. I said it. Tota, totalitarian. Sorry, I told Totalitarian. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Totalitarian. <laughs> <laughs> laughing. So he basically it means he wants a one man rule and everybody worship me to unify the nation. And it's also religious, not just political. So in other words, he was attempting to, uh, McGee says, he was attempting to institute a world religion. Antichrist does this, right? This was nothing in the world but a repetition of the Tower of Babel, a forming of one religion for the world, end of quote. So there we have uh, J. Vernon McGee saying that this was an attempt. It was, mil it was religious and political. Political to join up the different provinces of these other kingdoms and unify them, this building of the statue. And also religious so that he knew that religion was a unifying principle and that's what they're trying to do today with the world councils of churches and they're going to be successful during the tribulation period and we saw that this this world the, this huge there's a huge ecumenical movement that's going on in the world today and the catholic church is at the head of it and they're going to join they're going to try to unite the world's religions you know, I get the Dalai Lama to sit down with the Pope and, the, and you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the Muslims to sit down with the, 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 church, the Catholics and the Protestants and the, and the uh, Presbyterians and, you know, and uh, the witches. Even witches are involved. It's amazing what's going on. And this is all, uh, this is going to be uh, successful in the future during Daniel's 70th week. Now, we'll develop this further in the future. Now, some commentators, such as Farrar, call chapter 3 historic fiction. Whereas Montgomery, another commentator on Daniel, he says that the author of the book of Daniel drew, and I'm quoting from him, drew its materials from popular legends, end of quote. But this is the, their, their opinion is the result of the rejection of the supernatural, which I touched upon a few moments ago. The miracle of Daniel's three friends not being consumed by the flames of the furnace is rejected by those who deny the supernatural and the imminency of God, as I mentioned before, which says that God intervenes and the affairs of men. There is nothing in the context of chapter 3 or the entire book which suggests that the events recorded in chapter 3 are an allegory or fiction, but rather they make clear that the events in chapter 3 are historical. Now, Daniel chapter 3, as I mentioned earlier in the evening, it presents a classic case of justified civil disobedience. The Bible teaches, it does teach, that there are certain circumstances in which the Christian is justified in disobeying the government authorities. This is called civil disobedience, which is the performance of an intentional act that is prohibited by the civil authorities or refusal to perform an act that is required by the civil authority. Christians in the word of God are commanded to obey the Lord their God, but they're also called upon to obey the governing authorities. Romans 13, 1-7, that classic passage, 1 Peter 2, 13-17, and Titus chapter 3, verse 1. However, civil disobedience becomes an issue for the Christian when these two claims upon the Christian come into conflict, meaning that when God commands us to do something, like proclaim the gospel or teach the word of God, and the civil authorities prohibit this. The solution to this conflict is that the Christian is to obey God, not the civil authorities. This is illustrated in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, when the apostles were commanded by the Jewish authorities to not proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Peter told them, we must obey God rather than men. Hold your place. Look at Acts chapter 5, please.
totalitarian. Did I say it right that time? That's what I said. That's what I said. <laughs> it's going to drive me crazy when I listen to the playback. And go, ah, I'm crying out loud. I butchered that word. Gosh, that drives me crazy. Look at Acts chapter 5. Where can I start you out? Uh, let's see. Look at verse, look at Acts chapter 5, look at verse 17. Acts five seventeen. But the high priest rose up, this is after the death and resurrection of Christ, this is after the day of Pentecost, and the apostles are in the temple teaching about the gospel. So it says in verse 17, but the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy of the apostles. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and, daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called, uh, they called the council together, the Sanhedrin, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors, but, we, we, but when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, Jesus' name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us, the blood of Jesus. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Justified civil disobedience. The authorities are saying not to do it, and God says to do it. What do you do? Obey God. But be ready to suffer the consequences. So there's another classic case of uh, civil just, civil just, uh, justified civil disobedience. We studied it in Acts, uh, Exodus chapter 1. Remember the, Egypt, the Egyptian midwives, or the Hebrew midwives, I should say, disobeyed Pharaoh, uh, Egyptian midwives, disobeyed Pharaoh of Egypt's command to murder infant boys who were born to the Israelite women, since murder is against the law of God. In Daniel chapter 3, we see Daniel's three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refusing to worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up, and they were justified in doing so, because God prohibited, as we read earlier, the Israelites from practicing idolatry. Also, we're going to see it in the future. In Daniel 6, the civil authorities prohibited Daniel from praying to the God of Israel. He did it three times a day. And Daniel correctly disobeyed because God, obeying God is required if the civil authorities contradict God or prohibit the Christian from obeying God. So there we have this chapter. We'll be talking about it quite a bit. Is a classic passage about justified civil disobedience. Now chapter 3 of Daniel also records the great courage of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the face of great, great adversity and life-threatening circumstances, which was the direct result, their great courage was the direct result of their great faith in the Lord. You can always tell uh, someone with great, uh, great uh, faith in the Word of God will produce courage. So let's say, I mean, we're all, uh, some people are, uh, have it by nature are courageous. I don't, some people are not like me. But what we see is that when you have obedience to the God, you have faith in God's word and obey God's word, it will, the Holy Spirit will naturally produce this courage in you. And uh, so uh, all you have to be worried about is obeying God. And we see that uh, this courage is the result of the great faith of Daniel's three friends. They were courageous. And the, the flip side is, is when, and we'll see this with the Exodus generation, lack of faith produces cowardice and complaining. It produces cowardice and complaining. So you have to have faith and trust in the different. See, this is, this is what God does, people. You know, he's done this to me. He's done this to this church. I mean, we were in a bad situation two years ago, and so we kept going. 
And it, they, it was a little scary because it's the unknown, but we're still here almost two years later. And in, in despite the tremendous odds against us and, uh, and, people trying to, and the devil trying to stop us. So it's all God, God's glory. But we had faith in our God. And God, faith in our God appropriates his power. And we have faith in him, then he can do mighty things for us. And he's done that here. And we look forward in the future to him doing even, even greater uh, mighty acts. So Daniel uh, chapter 3 records the persecution of Daniel's three friends. And what is persecution? Persecution is the suffering or pressure, mental, moral, or physical, which authorities, individuals, or crowds inflict on others, especially for opinions or beliefs with a view to their subjection by recantation, silencing, or as, the, as, the last, as a last resort, execution. We're going to start seeing more of this in this country. As the more we secularize in our country and the more, uh, more biblical Christians like ourselves are, are in the minority, it's going to create a problem. Uh, for instance, uh, I'll say it's going on right now. You ever hear of hate crimes? Well, you know, they want to do in the country, they want to in this country, for instance, if I come out and teach that, uh, that uh, uh, homosexuality is an abomination of the Lord, they want to define that as a hate crime because the gays want, you, want to stop that kind of thing going out there because they want to promote their lifestyle. And so what if that happens? Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to defy the order because I'm told by God to re rebuke that. I'm not to I can condone that. I'm to, I'm to expose that as sin, which it is. So we see here that you, you and I might in the future might be persecuted for, for, because we have views that say, no, we don't agree with what, that homosexual, homosexuality is a legitimate lifestyle. No, we disagree with that. It's sin. And the people, you hear this, people say, oh, that's judgmental. That's right, it is judgmental. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. I hate the sin, but I love the sinner. All right? So I'm not, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm judging that behavior as sinful. Just like you would judge, you would, uh, judge if you were any kind of parent, you would, uh, somebody, a kid you loved, and when they come home drunk, you, you just say, oh, good, you know, go throw up in the thing, and you poor baby. Now, you'd be pretty angry with your teenager if they came home drunk as a skunk, throwing up all over your carpet or your wood floor. So you have to be, make a judgment. Bad behavior is bad behavior. But in our society, absolutes are gone. See, we live, you and I live by absolutes found in the, the word of God. And so therefore, the world doesn't believe in that. They believe in pluralism and, 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 and relativism and that you can make up your own rules. There's no right and wrong. And see, they, that's the world you and I are living in. And get ready. It's going to get worse. Because it's not going, the church is not making a stand. It's running from this, 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 this confrontation with the world, here in America especially. Now the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples to not be afraid of persecution from the authorities as a result of proclaiming the gospel, but rather he told them to fear God. The Lord Jesus Christ forewarned them again and again that it was inevitable and said that he, must, he himself must suffer it, which would be a test of true discipleship. Persecution would take different forms, he taught, ranging from every possible variety, from false accusation to the infliction of death beyond which, he pointed out, persecutors are unable to go, as I mentioned earlier. Serious persecution of the Christian church began with the case of Stephen, and his lawless execution was followed by a great persecution directed against the Christians in Jerusalem. This great persecution, noted in Acts 8.1, scattered the members of the church who fled in order to avoid bonds and imprisonment and death. James, the brother of John, who was slain with a sword by Herod Agrippa, and Peter also was imprisoned and was delivered only, uh, only delivered by an angel. In 2 Timothy, remember Paul speaks of his impending condemnation to death and the terror inspired by the persecution caused every Christian to forsake him uh, in uh, Asia when he was brought to public trial. So in Daniel chapter 3, we see that as a result of being persecuted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were suffering undeservedly in order to bring glory to God. The Bible teaches people, and we'll be seeing this in this chapter in detail, God uses undeserved suffering to advance his children to greater spiritual growth and to glorify himself. The believer must experience undeserved suffering because it's through undeserved suffering that you and I as believers are conformed to the image of Christ. Daniel, and we'll close it with this point of uh, this evening's study. 
Daniel, as I mentioned earlier, is conspicuously absent from Daniel chapter 3. Why isn't he there? Because the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us why. Uh, the IVP Bible background commentary on the Old Testament writes, and I'm quoting from them, Daniel's absence could be explained easily by the occasion setting in only a single province, end of quote. The Net Bible has the following comment, and I'm quoting from them, Daniel's absence from this scene has sparked the imagination of commentators, some of whom have suggested that perhaps he was unable to attend the dedication due to sickness or due to being away on business. Hippolytus uh, uh, supposed that Daniel may have been watching from a distance, end of quote. Well, I'll tell you right now, and we'll develop this further uh, later on in this study of this chapter, it's hard to believe that Daniel would have stood by and not intervened on behalf of his friends or even joined his friends in their justified civil disobedience. We know this because Daniel's character, as portrayed in this book, makes clear he would have intervened on behalf of his friends and even suffered along with them undeservedly. It's clear that Daniel was not present in the city of Babylon and was not present in the king's court for whatever reason or reasons which the scriptures do not present to us. Otherwise, he would have joined his friends in their justified civil disobedience if his intervention with the king on their behalf was unsuccessful. Furthermore, those Babylonians who brought charges against Daniel's three friends wouldn't have done so if Daniel was present in the king's court because Daniel was the favorite of Nebuchadnezzar, as recorded in chapter 2, as a result of fulfilling the king's demand to tell him the content of his dream and its interpretation. Thus, these Babylonians were emboldened to bring charges against Daniel's three friends, which is another indication that Daniel was not in the king's court. So Daniel, more than likely, was away on the king's business or in some other province or a part, another part of the kingdom or another kingdom itself because if he was there, anywhere there, he would have stepped in and intervened or suffered along with them because we know that from Daniel's character. So he must have been, we have to infer that he must have been away on the king's business. Uh, and and it, I doubt he'd be sick. If he was sick, he'd come out of the sick bed. We know Daniel. And he'd say, hey, he wouldn't use sickness as a reason not to suffer <laughs> at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. We'll pick this up in the, in, in on tomorrow evening with verse 1. Hope you enjoyed the overview. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this study in Daniel chapter 3 this evening. We pray that this overview would be a great blessing to the body of Christ and would have brought glory and honor to you and your son. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.